Let's continue learning about the different types of molecular species identification techniques. In this video, we will focus on metabarcoding. And metabarcoding is really cool. It's one of the relatively new technologies that allows us to characterize multiple species and individuals of a community simultaneously. So in this image here, I'm showing an overall workflow for metabarcoding. You do your sampling. And this is really the unique characteristic of metabarcoding is that you're able to take a bulk sample. So what that means is in this example, we have a jar with several different types of flies and invertebrates in there. In metabarcoding, because you're able to characterize everything simultaneously, what you can do is just take this bulk sample grind everything up, extract DNA from that sample as a whole, and then just like we talked about with DNA barcoding, you're still using a genetic barcode like CO1, for instance, to identify what species were in your original sample, but you're able to do that all at once. You don't need to separate out each individual. You can take a bulk sample and then use these bioinformatic techniques down the road to figure out which species were present in your sample. So ultimately, just like we talked about before, with all of this molecular species ID, oftentimes what you're trying to figure out is just what species were in your original sample to begin with. And just to compare how metabarcoding is different from barcoding, which we talked about previously, let's return to our fish egg example. So if we were to use a barcoding approach, which we've talked about previously, what you would need to do is isolate DNA separately from each one of these fish eggs. And then from there, you would do PCR to obtain your CO1 sequence. But with barcoding, you have to do each individual separately. With metabarcoding, what's so great is you can just take this whole sample of fish eggs extract DNA and actually the way you extract DNA from fish eggs you can just squish them. So what you could do is just squish this whole vial of eggs, get DNA that way, and then you would end up with a bunch of CO1 sequences that you could then figure out which species were in your sample. But metabarcoding, the main characteristic is you're able to do this bulk sampling where you can just take all the eggs at once. And if we wanted to amplify DNA from multiple different species at once, from a bulk sample, for instance, in metabarcoding, think back to things we've talked about previously. What type of primers do we need to use if we want to amplify DNA from different types of species at once? If you remember, what we've talked about before are these universal primers. So here is an image that we've seen before, one of the previous videos. It's a sequence alignment for different hoofed mammals. So say we were taking a bulk sample, that bulk sample contained different DNA from hoofed mammals. We knew that much. What we could do is use these universal primers that are highlighted in these blue boxes here. The universal primers will amplify DNA from any of these species, and we can then figure out down the road how many different species were in our original sample. But we're able to do that because these universal primers exist that allow us to amplify DNA from multiple different species at once. So really, metabarcoding and this process of taking bulk sampling is possible because of two main reasons. It's possible because of universal primers and because of high throughput sequencing. So here's another image showing a workflow for metabarcoding. So first what we're doing is starting with a bulk sample of invertebrates, for instance. And because there are universal CO1 primers available that can amplify DNA from all of these types of species, we're able to do metabarcoding. So that would actually come in in this step here. If we walk through this workflow, we have our bulk sample. 
we're taking the DNA from all of those species, all of the individuals present in our sample. And remember, because it's barcoding still, we're only looking at one particular region of the genome. So here in this image, we have just DNA from everyone, the entire genome. Once we do this universal primer PCR step here, what we end up with is just a fragment of the genome from each of those species. Oftentimes we said that's CO1, that's the genetic barcode that's used. That's the only region of the genome we need is just CO1. And then we can use that CO1 to figure out what species it is. So here in this step, we've used universal primers to get our CO1 PCR product. And then we use high throughput sequencing to get all of this sequence data back. So remember with Sanger sequencing, which is what's used with DNA barcoding, you have to do each individual at a time because you can only get one sequence at a time. The benefit of high throughput sequencing is that you get, it's massively parallel sequencing. You can sequence a bunch of things at once and get a bunch of sequence data back all up together. And that's why you're able to do this meta barcoding bulk sampling approach because you can do this simultaneous sequencing, get a bunch of these sequences back, and then use bioinformatic techniques to figure out which samples came from which individual. So here in this example, they're color coded. So we have two of these kind of dark forest green sequences, and we could figure out those both came from this particular species here. And then oftentimes what you're trying to do is figure out what species were present in your sample in what type of relative amounts. So you often end up with these taxonomic diversity plots that can tell you based on the DNA amounts that were present in your high throughput sequencing, roughly how many individuals from each of those species was present in your sample. So in this sample, for instance, we see that most of our sequence was this guy right here, just based on the color coding. So you can get these types of taxonomic diversity plots as a result of metabarcoding studies. And that's actually one of the things we're going to do in lab is generate one of these types of plots. So in week two, we started working with this garter snake metabarcoding data set. So that's actually what we've been working with in lab. We'll continue this week. In this particular example, and this was all data we got from Dr. Ray Enke and Dr. Rocky Parker at James Madison University. So big thanks to them for sharing their data with us to play with. So here, what they did is they took samples from male and female garter snakes and what they were looking at and what our particular data set is looking at is what bacterial species are present on the garter snake. So they're swabbing the garter snakes, extracting DNA from those swabs, using those universal primers to amplify just that one particular region we need to identify what bacteria were originally present. We get a bunch of sequencing back from our high throughput sequencing. And so this is what we're using DNA subway for in our lab is to analyze all that high throughput sequencing data. And then in the lab this week, we'll continue on with that analysis and actually generate one of these taxonomic diversity plots to help us figure out if, for instance, the bacterial communities are different in male versus female garter snakes. And there are some other really cool examples of metabarcoding. When I was looking through your textbook, I learned some new things. I didn't actually know they could use metabarcoding for these types of things. So this is one super cool example. I have the citation here at the bottom. There's also a link for Sci-Hub. Remember, if you ever can't find a paper, just take the DOI number that's associated with every paper, plug that into Sci-Hub, and you can get the full paper. So here's one really cool example where they wanted to assess biodiversity, so figure out what type of species were present at their site. They were working in particular at Barrow, Coronado Island, Barrow, Colorado Island. That's harder to say than I thought. In Panama. 
And what they were doing is trying to figure out what mammals were present at that site. But they went about that in a really cool way. So oftentimes, traditional methods, if you were trying to figure out what mammals were there, you would do um, some type of camera trapping or some kind of visual survey. Sometimes that's hard if you have rare mammals or you don't want to disturb them, they're hard to find. So what they did is they actually sampled carrion flies which eat meat of mammals. And when they eat the meat, the DNA from the mammals is actually transferred into the fly. So what they did is get DNA from each of these flies that they collected, use universal primers that were specific to mammals. So you're only amplifying the DNA from the mammals and not the fly itself. And they were able to then use metabarcoding to figure out what type of mammals were present at this island. And when they did that, what they found was, and I decided I'm going to draw this for you, so bear with me. They're going to be terrible. Maybe it'll be your entertainment for today. See if you can guess what I'm trying to draw as I'm doing it. That's a monkey. So when they did this study, they found there were several different types of monkeys present at this site. They also found, it's like Pictionary, but bad Pictionary. They found several different species of birds. And then lastly, some lizards. Okay, obviously these are terrible drawings. Hopefully they're amusing for you. So when they did this study, they took the DNA from the carrion flies and they were able to figure out from metabarcoding that at this site, there are um, several different types of monkeys, birds, and lizards present. One important thing to note that's gonna show up in one of the questions you get later is that we're using universal primers. In this case, they used universal primers for vertebrates. So it'll amplify all these different vertebrate species. It wouldn't be possible in this type of study to amplify, say, both vertebrates and invertebrates. There isn't a universal primer available to amplify both of those very different types of species because their sequences are too different. So that's Metabarcoding is possible because of universal primers, but at the same time, there are some limitations to those primers. Like we said, there are universal primers available for fish species or invertebrate species, but if the taxa are too different, like plants and vertebrates, for instance, you can't use the same set of primers for both of those. So in a metabarcoding study, you wouldn't be able to identify species of both plants and mammals because they're too different from each other. But overall, this is one really cool example of metabarcoding, and it can help us look at biodiversity in these new molecular ways that can complement or some cases are even better than the traditional survey method.